And I'm Jeff Bluestone. I'm Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost. And my job today is to sit back and listen with the rest of you. But I want to put a couple of things in your mind as you listen to this. What this group uh, has been asked to do is to weigh in on some of the ideas that were put forward um, in the uh, competition that you all have been talking about for the last hour and to think about how those ideas might translate into some big and disruptive approaches that the CTSI could take um, in, its, in its renewal. And so as they talk, um, I think the, the goal is to push back in both directions. Is this really the kind of things that is gonna separate the CTSI and advance the agenda as Clay uh, laid it out this morning? Are these the kind of ideas that are gonna get away from an individual scientific uh, problem or clinical problem, but to create an infrastructure that will foster the kind of uh, uh, success in, in the continuum that, uh, that Keith referred to, of bringing our most fundamental uh, research uh, out to the patient and out to the community. Are these the kind of ideas that you see as ideas <laughs> that will transform the, um, the clinical and translational research enterprise here at UCSF to one that doesn't just talk the talk, but, but actually walks the walk. Because I think in the end, why we're all here today and why everybody has been so um, involved in the CTSI is the, um, is the expectation, the, 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 the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Because I think we all realize that if we could harness the incredible talents in our individual um, units and in the individual departments and institutes and ORUs. If we could just take a small piece of each of us in what we call siloized, but I believe individual excellence that we all have, if we could just take a piece of that and translate it across the enterprise, we could make the whole greater than the sum of the parts, which is of course one of the reasons why the CTSI holds so much promise. So each of these folks are gonna get a few minutes to talk about one of those 10 ideas, all of which were excellent, and to articulate some of their thoughts about them. Then we'll spend some time after each of them to discuss it, asking you questions and you can ask them questions. And then maybe towards the end, we'll try to synthesize some ways to move forward so that Clay et al. Um, can have a, um, a roadmap for how to think about some really special ideas uh, going forward in the, in the renewal and set us up for success. So why don't I start out with my colleague to the left here, Liz. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. I prepared some remarks because Minnie told me I had three minutes and I would be cut off at three minutes. So she made me a little bit nervous, so I thought I'd prepare. So the key university theme that I spend all my time thinking about is education. And the proposal that I want to focus on today is the grants program for collaborative multidisciplinary translational research. I'm interested in how we train our graduate students for the future. As many of you know, last year the NIH came out with a report on the biomedical workforce. Nationally, just 43% of biomedical PhD graduates remain in the academy. Another 42% are engaged in research or some other kind of scientific enterprise in government or industry or nonprofits, and 13% leave science altogether. So this fall, we did a study of the career outcomes for our uh, PhD grads at UCSF to see how these alumni fare. Turns out that more than half, 53% of UCSF biomedical PhD graduates work in academic research and teaching. Similar to the national population, we have about 44% who do science in non-academic settings, and only 3% of our grads leave science. Our PhDs who go on to work in non-academic settings have told us, and their prospective employers tell us as well, that the ability to work collaboratively in multidisciplinary teams is, part, is a key part of a successful graduate skill set. And for those who stay in academia, if innovations in translational research are going to come from collaborative projects that cut across disciplinary, disciplinary borders, then we have to provide opportunities for students to train in these new environments. Currently, our students are somewhat constrained by the existing system that rewards individual success. That is, students go into the well-funded labs of successful independent investigators who then serve as role models to these researchers in training, and the cycle is perpetuated. I would love to see innovation in graduate student training become an integral part of the CTSI mission. 
Now, to date, CTSI's educational efforts have focused on clinical and translational researchers. Just this morning, I made welcoming remarks to the incoming cohort of students in the master's program in clinical research. And almost all of these students come from clinical backgrounds. But I imagine that the courses offered would be of interest to a broader population of students. I wonder if there's a way for CTSI to expand its embrace to include the students who come to UCSF for world-class training in basic science. The proposal funding collaborative, multidisciplinary, translational research specifically notes that basic scientists and clinical scientists work in different worlds. And this is reflected in the fact that when I looked at the registration list for this retreat, I saw that only one of the basic science PhD program directors had signed up. So, the challenge I pose to this group and to the CTSI is, how can CTSI help to bring together the different research communities at UCSF to the benefit of the scientists, to the benefit of the students, and ultimately to the benefit of the innovative and translational quality of the research they produce? And so I'm going to start out with a question, because I see him way in the back. I see Charlie Craig in the back. And I'm going to ask Charlie, as director of our program in chemistry and chemical biology, can you comment on how your students might benefit from working in multidisciplinary translational settings? Thanks, Liz. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'll be brief because there's there's uh, four other people that are five more people that are going to speak. But <clears throat> I was struck, as you were, uh, having been at this meeting so far, that Tony Coyle asked, "What is a group that's not represented yet?" And I'd say the basic scientists are not the graduate students have not been tapped into yet. Uh, I don't think all of them necessarily should be tapped into, but some of them specifically came to UCSF versus UC Berkeley versus. Uh, MIT or some of the other places because there are the health sciences here where they can tap into. Um, so I think there are ways to bring a cohort of them in if there's a portal that's made available. And one way is by, by pairing up some of our training grants that are very basic to some of the clinical um, settings, some of the institutes, some of the foundations, and we really need the clinical folks to help us make those, those connections. So that's one of the ones that I've been thinking about that, that really um, CTSI, CTSA could really help us do. There's other ones as well, but I'll, I'm trying to stay, stay focused. Thank you. Are there other comments? Because I could throw out a bunch more questions. Liz, I, I'd just uh, comment that we've, we've made a number of attempts at creating that linkage at the student level over the last few years, whether it's through the Howard Hughes program or uh, a variety of other um, sort of bench to bedside type programs. And they've been very hard to sustain. And some of it, I think, is the geography, mm -hmm. the, the two campus uh, issue. Um, but I don't think we've, we've yet identified uh, the, the, uh, the right tactic to use to, to get that sort of sustained uh, interest and maybe it's as Charlie said we've got to uh, f focus on those graduate students who came here with that and not try to force it on the entire entire group and really build a strong program for a cohort that that want to engage but it's been a surprising challenge uh, so so we can't as I understand it since we don't have a large representation of that community here but we do have a large representation of the other others the rest of the community is there an interest, a desire to interact more with the fundamental researchers on, in, in our basic science departments? Is there, do you see a need in your world to have more connectivity with those interested in understanding the fundamental mechanism of health and disease? And what, what would you do to, to try to foster that interaction from your perspective, uh, instead of it all having to go the other way? Mini. So I'm actually. So I'm actually going to speak without my CTSI hat, actually, but more as a as a graduate of our graduate program and a basic scientist that for the last seven years has been immersed in clinical and translational research. So I would propose that one one thing that I can tell you is certainly missing from my graduate education <coughs> is an exposure to what clinical research really looks like. I think beyond that, who picks that up? 
will see, and it'll be self-selected, and there'll be some that pick up on it. But even to be exposed to the fact that you know, a lot of clinical research is this massive enterprise, some of which involves you know, doing studies at multiple different places with multiple different phenotypes, it's a, it's a very different feeling than what we did as basic scientists. So I would suggest that even thinking about, instead of having the bridge, focusing instead on just exposing models of clinical research, bringing clinical researchers in to talk about how they define a question and, and sort of what's involved in doing the study could be really helpful. So that's what my non-CTSI hat on. And with my CTSI hat on, I'll say that we do have some programs, and Deborah Grady can speak more to it, we do have some programs that reach out to graduate students, but I absolutely agree that I think it's a real gap, and I think it needs, it, it can't be an incremental approach. There's, there's something that needs to be rethought if we're trying to make that connection. It's just not going to be, oh, add, you know, say that PhD students are also included in the admissions criteria. That, that I think, will not work. Well, I think Sam makes a good point about, you know, you know it's been difficult to bridge um, and to try to think about a way to include all graduate students. And I very much like your point of just starting with a smaller group. There's probably a much smaller cohort who would be genuinely interested in learning about what clinical research is or how their research might become translational. And I guess I would look to the, the numerous CTSI courses that are offered in clinical research and figure out a way that we could open them up to graduate students. Currently, as we know, it's not easy for people not enrolled in ticker to take the ticker courses. But I've, when people have been exposed to them, they've been really interested. So I'd love to see a way for us to expand those offerings to the students identified who would like to learn more. I think Mike uh, has a Mike. Research and also apply the basic, the, the great basic research that's happening here and put them together. And I think there'd be a, a number of labs that would see that as an attractive thing to do. But one of the, one of the parts that's not been mentioned is, and, and you know, I think it's true that pe we will self-crystallize into teams, and if there is an incentive such as the one that this uh, particular proposal has um, put in front as a carrot, that is where basic scientists and clinicians will come together to work and have <coughs> money to work, one of the things that they need to learn how to do is how to work together in teams. And, and we tend not to be people who are collaboration ready. We tend to be, you know, we're selected into the fold in which we live. And, and there is, um, you know, a great thirst for knowledge. And one of the things that could be taught and that is taught in companies is how to work together in a team. And I would see that as a very critical thing that CTSI could do and the graduate programs for that matter. If I can just add something, I want to make a generalization and that is what was just described, this gap is not unique to UCSF. This is a national issue with the CTSIs. And correct me if you disagree, Clay. And so I would try to put the glass half full here. So what is it that we could do here to make this CTSI more robust, maybe even looking forward to the reapplication, that we do certain things that identify the gaps, the reason why it is a national phenomenon, and do something different here that makes us more inclusive and makes the science, I think, uh, truly more complete in a translational standpoint. So Jeff, I think on that, what I'm going to do is go to John. Charlie, just a minute. Jeff, can I just interject real quick? Because <coughs> I thought it might uh, help a little bit. Um, one of the things that's already happening at UCSF off, uh, kind of one-offs, are where there is co-mentorship between a basic scientist and a clinical um, <coughs> scientist. It, it's not formalized. And it's kind of because someone happened to know someone. I think just having the speed dating, having the kind of connections that CTSI could enable could allow that sort of thing to happen a lot easier, uh, it, it seems. So with that preemption, I'm going to turn it over to John, <laughs> who's going to talk about the, the, um, the one proposal that came out, which was the speed dating proposal. OK, thanks, Jeff. Uh, yes, I've got the the task, which I'm very pleased to have, actually, of talking about the speed dating proposal, which is to put t together forums so that scientists, cl clinicians, the whole uh, spectrum can come together and learn about what each other's expertise is and form collaborative units as a result. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples from my life as how that happened accidentally. And I'm absolutely convinced that this can be part of the glue, it can be part of what Liz was talking about, to bring people together that didn't even think they wanted to be together. And seeing Charlie's in the back of the room, 
Uh, if we go back almost 20 years ago when I was first here and you were first here, we were both persuaded to go on the Committee on Research. And we sat together beside each other and Charlie said to me, and turned to me and said, who are you? And I said, oh, I'm John Featherstone in dentistry. And I said, who are you? He said, Charlie Craig in pharmacy. And he said, what do you do? I do this and I do that. And I've got an RO1 on cystatins. And he said, oh, so do I. Something like that, Charlie. I think it was how the conversation went. And at that chance encounter, our two postdocs came together and started working collaboratively together with antibodies and, and so on. So that's a very simple example, not translational research, but how a chance encounter brought us together and brought our postdocs working together. And, and I can speak with conviction on the speed dating thing because I'm in my third marriage now and I think I've got it right this time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if we, if we <laughs> come back to science for a moment, uh, also soon after I was first here, uh, I was asked to give a, a presentation in pharmacy, in the School of Pharmacy in their seminar series because of what I had been doing. And after that presentation, Dick Schaefer came up to me and he said, oh, I have a colorimeter that would work for you if you want. And I said, oh, that's in my past history. Anyway, it turns out my, one of my postdocs worked with uh, him and his colorimeter, and then he and I put grant money together to buy another one. What's that got to do with translational research? Well, eventually, another uh, person in, in our research environment in the School of Dentistry started working with that equipment and doing some very nice work, which will eventually, we think, lead to some product uh, uses. So let's fast forward to another example. Uh, a couple of years ago, Joe DeRisi was asked to, to our Research and Clinical Excellence Day as a keynote speaker. And he gave, as usual, his fantastic uh, type presentation. And a young woman by the name of Ling Zan, a PhD microbiologist, a pediatric dentist, and a clinician and a translational scientist, said, that's the man I need to talk to. So she went and talked to him. And now we've forged a, a multi-person collaboration, which goes right from fundamental microbiology and chemistry through to translational research where this is going to be part of the personalized uh, medicine or precision medicine of the future, looking at specific strains of bacteria and genes within those bacteria which determine the way that uh, diseases go on in the mouth. So that's just a few examples and oh my goodness if we'd had a speed dating system in place I think those collaborations could have gotten together even more effectively and more quickly amongst people who didn't even think they had things in common. So that's my pitch. I think it's a fantastic idea. The devil will be in the details and uh, hopefully that will help to glue everything together. Thank you. So let's talk about a couple of the details because we there, there was a team back in the room who talked a little bit about it and I think there are a couple of areas where I think people could weigh in on. Um, how, how, how broad would you make the speed dating? Would you go across um, the campuses? Would you go outside to industry and the community? How, what kind of reward system would get you excited about sitting around um, for an afternoon and meeting a bunch of people that you didn't know before and might have some interesting things that they do? and how would you want to um, follow up on that afterwards? And then lastly, what would be the kind of um, um, connectivity that you would try to, to break down, uh, the, the barriers you'd try to break down? Would it be by campus? Would it be by discipline? Would it be by type of research or type of clinical activity? Be interested in people's thoughts on that. has any thought. Let me give a quick thought which might prompt somebody into action. One of the things that we're very good at on this campus is being open to each other. And we also have the uh, profiles there, which is wonderful, but I don't think that the profiles are being used to the extent they could. So we put this all in together and we can go at least amongst the schools because who knows that in the School of Nursing there's somebody that has expertise in a particular area that's needed. In the School of Pharmacy, somebody that does uh, computerized drug development. In the School of Dentistry, somebody who's working on cancer cells 
that might be relevant to cancer in some other part of the body, and so on. And what about Lawrence Livermore? What about the people over there that can bring tremendous collaborative work towards us? Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Do we want to go that far and bring them into the speed dating? I personally think we should. And I, I'd love to have some input from people rather than the, the stony silence. Do you think this is a crazy idea? Yeah. Do facilitated uh, lunch, speed dating with food for, for uh, <laughs> small numbers of people. Which is the part that's exciting to you, the dating or the food? <laughs> Both. At, at our right. table when we were right. talking about this, this was an idea, not quite like that, that came up, but maybe dinner meetings in uh, alumni's homes, or I said we could have one in my home, for example, uh, enough to bring 20, 25 people together. I think that's a great idea to break down the barrier of just sitting in a sterile uh, lecture hall. I think you're onto something. It's also bringing people together around a specific topic. And, and I think to get to your question, Jeff, it's breaking down the barriers of geography. I've had faculty tell me that when they moved from one building to another, they never saw their faculty in the old building anymore. They had wonderful colleagues on, you know, in their pods in the labs near them, but that they rarely saw the people that they used to collaborate with. So I think it would be useful to bring people together around topics and then actively draw from our multiple campuses. And, and then add a level of incentive that isn't, isn't excessive. So say that before you leave the room, you have to form a team and to uh, work on a pilot project or whatever the outcome is, and whoever successfully does that before they leave the room, in some order of, of uh, review process thrown in, five or ten thousand dollars to to move to the next level, so that so that people come in with uh, the expectation that before they leave something will actually happen, because I think a lot of times we do connect well, but moving to the next stage is often the, the bigger bigger challenge. That, that actually is part of the proposal to have pilot money uh, on a competitive basis <coughs> for people who are coming together and be, to be able to apply for that money. But what you're saying is to do it at the speed dating right. so there's a, an immediate uh, peer review or some, something. What a crazy idea. But what I, mean, I, I just want to make sure I understand it because I'm trying to... So the concept of the table and, and what I've heard is, is that you bring in large groups of people and let them all meet each other. And you were talking a little bit about one-on-one -on -one engagement, and then you build polygamous relationships after that. Is that the, is that the general idea? Not one-on-one, -on -one, but uh, maybe one department with another department. I see. So, so, so uh, yeah, we had an interesting discussion about the table, is, is that how much do you drive the focus? Because how much do you lose when you think you know what the connectivity should be, and maybe they're just spontaneity, spontaneity outside of it? Any other uh, quick comments? Because we're going to move on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not sure we're not stuck in the last decade. When I talk to all my young friends, they're not doing this speed dating thing anymore. They're like hooking up online. And <laughs> those, those things are usually, however, facilitated with the right questions, the right, you know, second step. So matchmakers.com and all that kind of thing, that's the sort of thing they do. So I'm not sure we shouldn't start at least with something like that before we bring a whole bunch of people together and feed them. <laughs> so yeah, one, one last comment, yeah. Yeah, I think we already have profiles, so I wonder uh, if we can initiate some groups based on topics of interest, so different people can join different groups, so we can initiate discussions and collaborations within the groups. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, I don't know if that's practical to do. Uh, just like uh, at LinkedIn, we have, th there are so many uh, different discussion groups, so people from um, the whole wide world can join different groups, so we can put people with a uh, common interest into the same group. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build on the last two um, comments that were made and, and turn it over to, to, to Sam, because I think that um, connectivity like what, what the two of you have been talking about, online connectivity and, and, and self-aggregating groups, depends on having um, aggregated information 
that allows you to mine and therefore figure out who are going to be the kind of people you want to work with, which means that we are entering in an age where we have to think about data and we have to think about infrastructure, whether it be cores or the like, in a different kind of way, where they're, they're, they're not just pieces of, they're not zeros and ones, but they're community building enterprises as well. And so one of the proposals, or two of the proposals that came in, were how to think that CTSI can think about differently about how, how to put information together, both data as well as connectivity. And maybe Sam could speak to that. So the, the, the theme that I would like to uh, draw on is, is the two groups that talked about data, and it builds on the, the uh, School of Medicine Leadership Retreat we had in 2012, which was all about uh, data. And a year and a half later, uh, I'm worried about the speed of progress that uh, we have, and I'm more convinced than ever that this is a critical issue for clinical translational science and a, and a critical way to do some of this tying of the community uh, together. I, I think it's time that we as an institution made an absolute commitment to data analytics. Um, it cuts across the areas that the two specific groups talked about, which were large public administrative databases. Uh, and uh, Keith and others described it very well in the precision medicine uh, monograph uh, with the analogy to Google Maps. Uh, layering different databases on top of each other. It speaks to what we can do across UC Health. It speaks to what we can do with Kaiser. Um, but I think it is absolutely uh, critical that we make an institutional commitment to the analytic part. Now, I, I know we have uh, in uh, the commitment to the Institute for Computational Health Science is a, is a great step, but I see what uh, needs to to be there is the service component of data analytics and uh, how we do that and uh, do we break it up into small groups. The group I was in was on uh, the uh, administrative data concierge concept which really focused on large public databases and enabling uh, investigators to link across us uh, one-time static public databases. Um, and, and I think a, a fundamental organizational question that the CTSI can help with um, is, is this a big enough problem that we should break it down into what I would call segments like that, a focus in, in public administrative data sets, another focus on how we deal with increasing uh, clinical data coming out of uh, APEX, another focus on genomic data sets, or do we think about this in a much more holistic uh, way uh, right from the outset so we don't uh, run the danger of in our uh, good intentions to create access to data, uh, create silos from the outset. So I think that's a fundamental organizational uh, question to be raised. Uh, more specifically on the group I was on, and maybe I'll, I'll ask uh, Kirsten to comment because she has uh, specific expertise that I do not. Um, there seems to be an internal component, meaning we need to build uh, the skills capability uh, to help faculty uh, navigate and create linkages between these databases. But I think we potentially, and uh, as, a, as a, a consortium of CTSIs, whether it's within UC or a larger group, uh, go to the owners of these databases uh, who are themselves siloed from each other and engage them in a conversation about how to create these linkages so that we don't end up with uh, huge regulatory uh, security and other hurdles uh, to, to marry these data sets uh, across <coughs> each other. So I, I, I think it's a fundamental commitment to data analytics. Um, I had the privilege of uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, sitting and listening to six national uh, uh, leaders of various stripes from technology to uh, biotech to uh, large uh, uh, university systems uh, sort of debate whether or not uh, such a commitment is timely and uh, the, the uh, overriding answer was absolutely um, that time has probably actually passed uh, but the the need to have expertise in data analytics, particularly of large unstructured databases, which uh, at least 
listening to this conversation as a, as a non-expert, I was convinced is an area that uh, we, we need to really build. So I think uh, the CTSA grant um, needs to think about uh, what, what our shortfalls are in analytics, how we structure ourselves around this um, from both a research perspective, but I think even more so from a service perspective. Because if we get it right, I think it will serve the purpose of um, be a, a strong enabler for that kind of dynamic uh, team assembly and disassembly that, that Keith uh, referenced. So. And, and I'll just add my addendum to that, which is, um, is registries and repositories, because that's going to be the source. And we've done a pretty good job of, of siloizing those areas as well. And anything we can do to help bring all of that together, I think will be helpful. So, Kirsten, do you want to just mention the, the regulatory hurdles uh, of even when there are existing public databases, how, how you have to work? Linkages between data, mostly to for um, um, broader ranges of hospitalizations, for example, or linkages to mortality records, and um, we talked about sort of defining exactly what type, what would be the real scope for this, because currently there exists lots of administrative challenges to linking data sets that each individual investigator figures out on their own. Um, those are both regulatory and administrative, and um, and so there could be some economies of scale for a, a, a group to focus on this. We also talked, though, about, um, as Sam said, sort of the broadest impact would be to, to think through what makes these administrative data different than other data that we'd like to link, um, whether this is unique, and, um, and uh, the focus on the, the data that maybe most have the um, broadest impact for us it might be linking, for example, um, uh, the hospitalization data or, or the, the medical record data within our own systems. So. There, there are significant challenges, as many of you who work in these data sets uh, know, um, but I think defining exactly what this group would address, I think, would, would allow it to have its maximum utility. So, so Clay, um, as, as CTSI director and holder of all the money, um, <laughs> and, and the one most likely to succeed in being able to do this, what kind of incentives do you see CTSI being able to use that will both benefit the recompete, but as well as to be able to get what I think everybody believes to be a key element to our future, which is being able to harness and to liberate the data? And, and how do you see CTSI playing an important role in doing that? Yeah, so I would say um, one, so. CTSI resources are less than what they used to be and feel scarce at all times. So, um, so in terms of what we can do with the, with the dollars that we have, it's obviously limited. But I think that I think the, the, the um, place where we can help the most, and actually this was part of our strategy, I've got to tell you about it, in the informatics space. We, you know, the, the first version of the um, integrated data repository we built with our money, and then we handed it over when the campus recognized that it was an important goal for itself. Um, and so we don't actually fund it really anymore. But we fund new add-ons and that sort of thing, but we don't fund it. And that's sort of been our model, is thinking about the stuff that others aren't ready to do, and then uh, getting enough sort of interest, making sure the model makes sense, and then handing it off to, for, to the bigger topics, which are represented on this stage, I might say. <laughs> <laughs> and the, um, but I would say the one place that I think is a, is a great example of where we um, actually can be really useful um, to sort of uh, mint money a little bit is through the collaboration piece. So, um, so UC Rex is actually a, a good example of that. So I think um, I mean maybe this is just our money that's been regurgitated back to us. But what we did with UC Rex is we took the Brave Consortium and we said, OK, we're bigger than just one campus. We're five campuses. We all have this problem. Let's solve it together so that everybody can get access to their electronic health record data, at least to identify people who would, could be approached to participate in studies. Um, pretty simple thing. We went to UCOP and said, this is a big problem, not a little problem. Let's solve it together and got UCOP to, to contribute the money to, to pay for that. Um, I think there are a lot more opportunities to actually build on that scale 
all of a sudden, you're much more interesting when you're big and you're not just solving your local problem. And I think that is actually a really useful tool to, uh, to think about leveraging as we move forward to solve some of these really expensive uh, problems. Clay, or I think I saw a Pinder in the room here a minute ago, but how, how uh, we, we sit within 40 miles of most of the big players in this, right? Whether it's Intel or Google or who, people who are really uh, pushing the envelope in data analytics. Yeah. And, and the linkage of, of big data sets. Uh, how interested are they in helping us? How, how we reached out to try to bring them in as partners yeah, so in this I, effort versus see, building it ourselves. Here, so I'll let him answer it too. But I, it's interesting. I was in a meeting with SAP, who you don't think of in the healthcare space at all, but actually they're in our hospital. They're in most uh, most medical centers, um, and they've decided to make healthcare a priority. This was a meeting about something else completely, and they said, "You know, are you guys trying to solve this uh, uh, personalized medicine problem because we have." this new database technology that we don't have a partner to help to develop it. So I, I do actually think there, there are real opportunities there to think about what, how those partnerships exist. It's interesting, I talked to him about what happened with IBM. So about a decade ago, was it a decade ago? Reg Kelly pushed this partnership with, with IBM to, do, to create a platform, a personalized medicine platform, and it, and it failed. Um, and it, you know, why? It wasn't because of anything Reg did or, or really anything IBM did. It was too early. Um, but I think that's, and also I think the cultures weren't well aligned. I think it's different now. I think we, do, we, we could work hard to solve that. Well, they do want to come back so we can, uh, we can talk about it. I, we're going to run out of time quickly. So a quick comment by Talmadge and Opinder. Penda might have something better to say than me, um, but I'm going to speak anyway. So the, I have two thoughts running through my head. The first is the issue about collaboration and getting people to work together. One of the things that I have experienced personally is that my expectations were too high. So if you get 100 people in a room together to talk to each other, if you're lucky if two of them end up connected. and so. I think we have this expectation we're going to get 100 people together and something fantastic is going to happen. And most of the time, nothing is going to happen. And, uh, but, and so when it doesn't happen, we then get discouraged and we stop doing it. But if we want something to happen, we have to build an infrastructure that keeps it going over and over and over. And we realize there's only one pearl in a million oysters. And so it's our expectations that I think are an issue that we have to come to grips with when we talk about getting people in the same room and what, what's going to happen as a result of it. And so I, it seems like we re really have to figure out that end of it. Um, and the other thing that's running through my head is this issue about the big data. Having done clinical research my career, most of the time what I put into the computer was junk. And I actually think most of what's in these big data banks is junk. And why are we wanting to analyze junk? And so I, I, it, um, until we know exactly what the questions are that we're trying to answer and figure out how to put those things in, I think most of this is a waste of time. Because we get all these big things back and then we find out that it's literally junk. And so I, it seems like the conversation should be about not that we have these big data sets and they seem like they're gold mines. Well, the, they, they may be gold mines, but you're going to pour a lot of water down there and you're going to shift a lot of worthless sand to find that gold nugget. And I'm not so sure we're prepared financially to pay for that. But to put your two comments together, the first one would suggest if you have a 2% success, then you should keep trying it. Your second one success suggests that if you don't have a 2%, more than 2% success, I think a lot of the data is junk. But if you can find that one in a million pearl out of the data, that would be pretty good, right? So you shouldn't give up on the big data. You should just make sure you're, you're getting the most out of it you can without having too high expectations, right? I can, I can buy that except that people who can't we in the last 10 years, we have reduced the best the people who have to gain power by shifting the data. And so until we're prepared to invest in the people who have the brain power to shift through the data, 
I think, because most of us in this room don't have a clue what we're talking about. We don't, we don't know where to start. We don't know what to do. There are only probably one or two people in this room who actually understand how to shift through all this big data stuff. And so are we willing to pay for those people to do it and then work with them over time? I think <coughs> that's the huge question. No, I think that's a great question, and I think it's partnership and it's, and it's money. I think we only have time for a pinder, and then we can see if we have any time at the end. Thank you. Um, Talmadge just pointed out, so you taken, I think, as uh, Sam said, if we're going to become a data analytical um, content type provider, those issues are going to come up. Clean data versus bad data is going to come up, and we're going to have to deal with it. Um, more specifically, I think, to, Dan, to your point, um, just literally about two months ago, I reached out to Leslie and CTSI to see if Eric Meeks was available to work on a project. And the project is actually, there are three new search engines that have come out in the last 18 months. And these search engines are targeted towards a very complex, unstructured data. Now they're not in the healthcare field, they're new, you know, they work for Federal Express, they work for AT&T, Telecommunications, and NASA. But those are the types of search engines that we love to do a small pilot on, and that's what I reached out to CTSI can we do a small pilot with these research engines and see what do we, what do we get? Um, if they're successful, we're talking about reducing the cost of accessing their data literally tenfold, from 10 million to a million dollars type thing. So th there's a lot of innovation in the Valley and we try and tap as much as we can. But it's not as formal as it should be, it's not widespread as it should be. And to partly tell them just point, I'm not sure we're investing enough um, <coughs> We're not investing enough in this area to get the right people to pull the team together to make it really make it happen. But it's something we can look at. Great. So one of the, 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 the themes of the last few um, comments, which I think are important, is that sometimes when you try to do things really big and very diverse, it, it just becomes untenable and, and feels very hard. So one of the suggestions that, that came out among those 10 ideas was to focus on one particular area and see what you could achieve by focusing on one particular area. And Joe, I think, is going to comment on one of those proposals that was around uh, Hep C. So uh, um, I'll preface that by saying that, uh, unlike I'm sure my colleagues here, I'm the only one that served as scribe at my table, <laughs> which says something very good about Mike McCune's ability to delegate and something very bad about mine. Um, <laughs> so um, hepatitis C. Uh, I, the things I'm going to say about it really, uh, number one, represent a disease state that could be applicable to many disease states uh, today. And if I were to use HIV as the past example, we uh, note that we were in a very reactive mode, but still UCSF had the ability to take on an epidemic and was uh, instrumental among others in terms of developing what is now uh, close to a cure, but not a cure. And the disease state that just now has had a very rapid pro proliferation of new drugs is hepatitis C. Uh, in the US, Paul can correct me if I'm wrong, one to two percent maybe the entire population has it, but in, uh, I think somebody was saying in Egypt, it's like 25 to 50 percent. So where the burden is, is elsewhere, and I'll get back to that in just a moment. So l let me say a few things about these drugs. Um, these drugs, essentially, which are likely to be here in the next year, uh, have the ability to cure hepatitis C, something that you can't say about too many uh, other chronic viral diseases such as this one. Relatively non-toxic, there is a problem in that they will cost $70,000 a year. So uh, the ba that's the background, and I could just as easily be talking about some of the new therapies for cancer, I see Margaret here that they are extremely expensive from an acquisition cost, but how are you going to deal with this? And uh, that said, I'll add one other thing. It's the world of the Affordable Care Act in the state of California, who is going to pay for this from a Medi-Cal Medi standpoint? And what about all these ACOs, including those associated with UCSF? How is that going to work in the picture? So that's the background. And I guess moving forward, if we were to say how to be most impactful, I guess if we put the narrow glass look at it, you would look mostly at the UCSF system, which could include the VA, it could include SFGH and Parnassus, and you know, uh, mine those databases so you see what patients exist, 
and develop a very multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary team toward innovative clinical research in this patient population. But if you really wanted to be impactful, you'd have to say, this is the wrong country. And in fact, if you could be blue sky and thinking big, to, as per our directions, you would partner in other countries. And the word that my group asked me to bring up is we need to be proactive about this disease state and how we're going to handle it. And I think there are enormous research opportunities here that is totally interdisciplinary, involving all schools, the graduate division, everything from basic science to uh, social sciences and health policy that could be part of this very proactive look. So I would say the, uh, the, the maximal innovation would be the broader, the better, realizing this is somewhat blue sky, and there are a lot of reasons that it won't work if you think that blue sky. In terms of what, UCS, what UCSF and CTSI currently has, I think that was the second question, I think we have many pockets of expertise, everything from uh, the clinicians that work with this disease to uh, economists that try to model how, in fact, uh, this ultimately impacts on healthcare systems and society at large. And in, but I would argue, from a personal standpoint, they are, I think we're fairly pocketed and not organized and cohesive yet, but in fact there would be opportunity there. And then if I were to look at uh, innovative partnerships moving forward to maximize the benefit, it w I've touched on some of them, it, we'd be thinking quite differently than we did before. Everything from the group said we should have infected patients as part of the research team from the get-go. Uh, you would also have ACOs who are going to have to figure out how to pay for this. The Department of Public Health in the state of California would be another important partner moving forward. And I guess the last thing I'll just say from a reflective standpoint, what would, uh, I always, my colleagues hear me say this often, I always think about, well, what is unique about UCSF and therefore what would make the, the CTSI renewal equally unique? And I would argue maximal participation by all schools toward the uh, evaluation scientifically of a disease state. In this case, it was hepatitis C, but again, we could flip this totally around to another epidemic, another need, um, and, uh, but we think, in fact, there is a uniqueness here that, in fact, could make uh, this a very important and interesting proposal. At the end of the day, we said, it's all about a proactive view on how you pay for this moving forward. So, it, and, and I'm not sure who to call on here. There are probably multiple people. Maybe I'll call on, um, Paul, when the HIV, Gilead, um, whole idea, I mean, it, this is sounding like this is something we didn't, uh, we didn't shy away from 20 years ago and, in fact, got companies to get involved, got ways of being able to be proactive, had patients <coughs> involved. Um, are we good at this? I, th I think what we, uh, what we did with HIV was, in, in, in retrospect, really good. but. You know, it was organic, it happened, and it took time, and in the end, I think we got the, the right partners together, and that's why it, it is so well, well regarded. But here we have a situation where we can kind of learn from that experience, uh, knowing that there's a revolution in, in, the, in the treatment coming. These drugs are going to be on the table in a year or two years, uh, and kind of look back, look where we are now, and, and redesign that, that approach. Um, Partnership with industry would be an exciting part of this, um, and we have one of the main companies that's in this uh, in this space just down the just down the road. So I think. So uh, if you were CTSI, yep, and you're thinking about a revolutionary proposal as a pilot or as a uh, focus in the grant, how would you construct? Now knowing what you know about the HIV world and how it was working with Gilead and right. how much pressure they came from the from the advocates. How would you approach this problem as a CTSI grantsmanship perspective? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd bring biotech into it, but I'd bring community engagement and the communities themselves and public health and epidemiology right, right from the start. I think we have um, uh, the availability. We, we've had Opinder and Doug come and talk to our, uh, our planning group. Uh, how can we share data both within the hospitals in, in San Francisco, but also through UC Braid uh, to the rest of the state? Um, and really create a, a, a model uh, knowing that we have a year to plan for it. I think this could be 
uh, as innovative as the people uh, that we bring to the table. And, and, and I think you know, planning with economists um, from the start, which we've never done before, we're always reactive. I think this could be uh, the next model. Others have any thoughts on uh, on this proposal? If anyone's looked at it, or is is Hep C the best disease to do it in? Is there a are there other areas we could have an impact like this? Jeff, um, this is Charlie again. D just to connect it back to the first point, I'd say two places where basic scientists, graduate students, could play a role in this is first of all the big data with the biomedical informatics graduate program where there's students that they spend their time developing algorithms to mine big data. There's, there's a place where they could play in that. And on the other end for, for the hep C story is really looking at the host pathogen interaction to start looking for resistance in the next generation of drugs. And so both of those are going to be early stage, but to not tie that into the CTSI I think is really missing a great opportunity because it's such great strength and I think it sets us aside and from some of the other CTSIs that don't have that connection. So for grantsmanship I, alone, I think that could really help strengthen the proposal. Great. Uh, any other comments? Uh, I'd like to, uh, Saul Rosenberg, I'd like to comment on um, answering your question. I think what UCSF is exceptionally strong in is epidemiology and interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, why couldn't we take a page from Steve Hulley's book? The best way to get good knowledge would be to do a prospective cohort study on a wide population and then when people develop a disease or a condition, randomize them into different treatments. That is actually the quickest and the cheapest way to find symptomatic relief and cures for illness. It's not cheap and it's, you know, it takes a long time, but it's much cheaper and much faster than relying on big data sets which give you correlational data that you have no way of interpreting. Um, I, I think the way absolutely to go is to look at the major problems facing this country and the world. The rapidly aging population. If there ever was a, a need for interdisciplinary research, that's it. 15,000 baby boomers are turning 65 every day. I'm one of them and there are a few of us in the room here. What are we worried about? Well, we've kept ourselves healthy. Um, maybe I'll get dementia. Is anyone in this room not concerned about dementia? No, I keep saying that 60 is the new 40. I don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> so w w to, to bring this together in a couple of ways, just following the, the Institute of Medicine, they've come out with an incredible series on the learning healthcare environment. Um, many people in this room have contributed to some of those, some of those articles. They came out with an incredible report on um, accounting for value in, in healthcare. And it's all pointing in the same direction. We, we need to go directly to the patients. We need to engage the patients. We need to get them to consent to giving us the data. And we need to collaborate across disciplinary lines to deal with the major healthcare issues facing the world. I, I think CTSI has to decide whether it wants to promote the health of biomedical research or whether it wants to promote the health of the world. Those two th are two different things. So, oh, well, I'm not going to go after that. So let me turn it over to um, yeah, me, David. Can I just make one quick point? Okay. Yeah, so not to actually to ask your question again. Try to think about that question. So, the, so we take a big risk when we study a specific disease. So we are we are about infrastructure, um, and so if we're going to study a specific disease, it has to be compelling that that's the right disease, and also a model. And Paul, you use that word, this will be a model. So as much as we can make this, you know, if this is the compelling model that we can create because it does some of the things that Saul just talked about. Um, because maybe, too, if we think about the research funding being established through the collaboration itself, that sort of thing, that, that's great. If not, we, it, it'll be risky. So I just wanted to think right. about 
Well, I think you have to look at every problem, this being one of them, is what kind of infrastructure could the CTSI be helpful in putting into place that would allow clinical investigators interested in tackling this problem, basic scientists who are interested in weighing in on it, and the community who would benefit from it to be able to do that all. And if CTSI is always thinking about what can we put in place to facilitate that, then it ultimately becomes disease agnostic, which is what's key. So let me just, uh, because I don't want to run out of time totally without giving David his, his shot. So David, why don't you go and talk about a couple what, things. What you want to talk about. All right. Well, the first thing I want to point out is the people at table 4.1, if you'll just raise your hand for a minute, that's the best table. <laughs> <laughs> now, there are a couple things that we've talked about I'd like to come back to. The first one was uh, the speed dating and uh, you know, rewarding partnering people coming together. And uh, you know, what are different ways that we can do that? And the efficiency now, I think it's interesting to look at what are other models that are out there. And we mentioned this briefly at uh, the table. And that is, if we meet each other in uh, dating, you're gonna forget most of the people that you met anyway, and you might only get two per thousand or whatever it is connections. Are there more efficient ways of doing that? And if we're talking about data analytics, you know, right now we've got the profiles, but can you t ratchet that up? Can you do the data analytics? One of the examples is, you know, in Amazon, uh, every morning I get an email that says, here, here are your uh, preferences for the day based on everything that's been out there for you, right? What are the kinds of things that we can put together that would make it efficient for information about people being shared with each other. You might decide to unsubscribe from that. But on the other hand, it's try to get our thinking about how is it that we pull people together. Most of the um, exciting kinds of collaborations that I've seen have been relationships through other people, the personal introductions. And that's not something that's very easy to do through the big data analytics, it's that personal uh, connections and references. So the dinner idea sounds pretty good, but then again, what's the return on that? It's the serendipity. How is it that you create those kinds of connections, those collisions? And I think that's something that we have to think about more for this uh, group going forward. Now in terms of the data analytics overall, thinking about where we're going, um, there are a number of factors, a number of levels that have been discussed today. You know, who are the partners that we're going to have? What are the levels that we're going to be dealing with? Uh, how is it that we're all going to uh, work with each other in order to advance the science in terms of having an infrastructure? And some of that, I think, is really building on what we've already started, which is how is it that you have health records that are interoperable between institutions that you're able to draw down on the data to be able to have specimen repositories, taking the months now leading up to the proposal to work out a joint consent arrangement for people entering into the system that their data can be used moving forward or if not, then not but at least having that set up as the infrastructure. Thinking of ourselves as becoming an accountable care organization, which is not going to be UCSF by itself, but it's going to be some combination collective of organizations. There have to be agreements that become worked out. This is something that we have to build towards and then how is it that we make ourselves uh, most data effective in bringing that together? Now that provides us information on numerators, but then also it's our partnerships with health departments, such as Kevin Grumbach was bringing together in his proposal, is where is the public data sets? How is it that we can most effectively draw them in? And again, this is becoming more and more expansive as we get into the description, but I think it's keeping the eye on March. Benefit from CTSI and how could CTSI 
during the renewal benefit from the community at large? Is that the th is that a retreat theme you're proposing, Jeff? Or a, a I said, yeah, I said, I said in yeah. a sentence or two. Yeah. I gave you yeah. more than a few words. Well, I think I'd echo what Sharon said on the first panel. I mean, I think it's the real transformational shift of mind is that you sort of figure it out and then, by the way, ask you know, your end users, including the community broadly defined, to sort of tell you whether you, they think it makes sense versus that they're at the table and ordering the meal with you and really your partners every step of the way. So I think, I think that's a world we're in now and it's as true for the early translational as the, the more sort of what we traditionally think is community engaged research. I think we're finding the same stuff with the UC Braid project on biorepositories. Um, I mean that will backfire if community members don't take part in that conversation early on, which is one of the projects for UC Braid that Dan Dohan is leading, to actually uh, understand how this can be in their interest rather it's than another Henrietta Lacks kind of scandal that erupts and people just feel that they've been experimented on without their consent and participation. So I think, I think that's just the consciousness we should embrace is that um, no science without us meaning the sort of community broadly defined, being a partner in that process, will benefit by having research that's more attuned to what the, the real compelling questions are and our <coughs> results are then more likely to be taken up uh, and resonate with the end users, which is the ultimate goal of translation, is that the research get used. And, and then I think for the public and our various partners, it makes them, um, more actively engage for that and shifts their uh, point of view to actually understand some of the challenges from the research perspective. So, um, so I just I think it's just a basic operating principle moving forward is that uh, that we have to do that. And uh, again, I think what we've tried to say it's more than just. Um, I mean, clearly there's issues around health equity and groups that have been traditionally disenfranchised, but it is. As somebody said earlier, I think again, Sharon, it's the nurse working in the ICU who's a clinician. It is the retail pharmacist. It's the community dentist. It's the uh, public health worker. It's the teacher working with kids with developmental issues and behavioral problems. That's, that's all our community and ultimately, right? Isn't that who we ultimately want to have the research be used by to improve the health uh, of, of the people we care about? Great. So we have a few minutes left. I think I'm supposed to be done at 4.30. So here we're going to practice um, one of the proposals. We're going to have speed questioning and speed answering. So I know a lot of people have raised their hands. There are a couple in the back there. There's Ida over here. So let's start in the back and see if we can do these short and sweet. Yes, I would like to add some, one more uh, thing from this gentleman. He said some many things about OEH and all this. Yes, um, is there any way that CTSI can enforce, like um, foster something that, like single, uh, single payer healthcare? All the, most of the countries in European countries, they have that. Even small, small little country in Asia, Taiwan, they have that. Here we are in the SA, the most uh, affluent country in the world, the most the richest country in the world, we do not have that. And Teddy Roosevelt have started that 100 years ago. And many other presidents, when they come along, they try to have single health care, health care. But the insurance industry defeat them, defeat them. Here we are. The Teddy Roosevelt start 19 something, and and now it's a hundred year already. Why not? Great. That's a great comment. And many are older, like him. Yes. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna try to get a we're gonna speed we're gonna speed question here a little bit. So if Maybe we can just, just one more sentence, please. Many unwanted, many unwanted um, fringe benefit, I call it fringe benefit, unwanted fringe benefit come along with age. Can we defeat that too, please? Right. Yeah, next person. Ida? Um, can't disagree at all that data is a lot of where our future is, but I actually very much agree with you. just point that there's a lot of junk data out there. There's also a lot of valuable data for understanding health that hasn't traditionally been in our purview. And by that I mean a lot of the social data that's out there. There's also data that's being collected by sensors. 
loads of companies are sitting on really rich data, like those tracking devices, self-reported apps. I think there's a treasure trove of phenotypic data that's out there that's really not HR data, it's not administrative data, it's not HHS data. So I think we have to really broaden what we consider data that will be very important for us to mine and to learn from. There is not going to be one general solution for what we call the data alignment problem, of making sense of all this data, cleaning it up and making sense of it. That's something you know the big companies are dealing with, but what's really missing is domain expertise, is what, you, what we have uh, in academia to combine that technology with what the meaning of the data is and question-driven analytics of the data. So I think what, what we need actually is a data concierge service. It's not just administrative data, it's to any kind of data out there. And that's a very generic approach, but that's really where the data science and the data analytics that we're going to need in healthcare to make sense of all the data, regardless of where it comes from. And yes, it is going to be an investment in expertise. It's going to be an investment in processes. It's actually not so much an investment in technology. And I think it would be good for us to start thinking about both data concierge services, maybe starting with the EDW, but I think broadly into other kinds of data that's just on the verge here. All that unstructured, crazy data out there. I think we are right at the forefront of really mining that for some really interesting things, but only driven by questions that matter to us in our community. So if I can put together what Kevin said and what you said, that one of the great opportunities for CTSI and one of the great opportunities for the community is to figure out mechanisms to fairly, safely, and um, equitably access that information and bring it to bear on the clinical problems that we're talking about. Great. Any other comments? Any other comments from the uh, esteemed panel up here? Everybody's happy? Clay, are you happy? Minnie, are you happy? Okay, well thank you everybody.